We thank you. Let us pray together. Father in heaven, we lift up our hearts to thee again this day with adoration, with thanksgiving, with uh, praise, thinking upon thee as the one who is high and lifted up, exalted all above the praises of Israel. We thank thee that we have been called out of uh, darkness into the marvelous light of thy kingdom and of thy son. We thank thee, O Lord, that we have been called out of a meaningless and worse than that uh, a life uh, to one which is full of uh, purpose, even the, the purpose of living to thy glory and of serving thee in the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. How unworthy we are of this calling, how inadequate we are to fulfill it. We uh, Our dependence is upon thee day by day. We need thy grace in all of the efforts we put forth to make known the, the gospel of Christ. We are dependent upon thy Holy Spirit. This is true of thy church at large throughout the world, and so for thy church we pray thee the blessing of thy presence by the, thy spirit to be a, a power unto salvation in the hearts of multitudes. Uh, be with us in our study of thy word. How uh, wondrous to have in our possession of the, the scriptures, the very word of life, the word of God, upon which we may build and know that uh, that which we build thereon will not be dashed to pieces, but shall last forever. Uh, build us up, therefore, in the, the faith, we pray thee, edify us uh, personally as we study thy word, and equip us to be building up uh, that uh, temple of the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray, with thanksgiving for all of thy mercies to us in him. Amen. Amen. <coughs> I return now to the book of Daniel, and we are concerned now with those two very similar chapters, chapters 2 and uh, 7, each of which then contains a survey of world affairs. And uh, the starting point, by the way, we've been looking at the, the four kingdoms, and we kind of discussed that connection with matters of introduction already, and uh, now by way of exegesis. Uh, but we've tried to identify the, the four kingdoms, as you know, in Babylon, you know, Persia, Greece, and Rome, and with uh, Rome then divided into, or, or with the fourth, uh, with the fourth kingdom divided into A and, uh, and uh, B sections. Uh, and more particularly, if, if you examine that, you see that the starting point of this, uh, of this delineation of the world kingdoms is with the, with the demise of the Davidic dynasties and not, and, uh, so it uh, is with Babylon that we start because it was uh, through uh, Babylonian Nebuchadnezzar uh, that uh, the line of David came to its end, that, that line which uh, was to endure uh, uh, forever and uh, yet at its typological uh, level does get interrupted as, uh, as uh, we know. And so the, uh, the scepter was going to remain in Judah until Shiloh comes, and uh, in the figure of Shiloh, uh, Messiah, then the, the kingship would be perpetuated, of course, forever, and, and yet, uh, in spite of that continuity that Genesis 49 uh, predicts, we do know there was the, the interruption uh, that began with the Babylonian exile. So the, 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 the kingdoms of the world are, are being described, or are, are singled out in terms of the particular nation that dominated uh, the uh, Davidic, uh, the Messianic, uh, the covenant uh, community. And uh, this is why, by the way, then uh, when we come to uh, uh, the fourth kingdom uh, and it divides into the two parts in chapter two, we we're talking then about the division between the legs of iron and the feet of iron and clay. In chapter seven, we're talking about the uh, the division between uh, the uh, beast with the ten horns, phase A, let's say, and then the, the face of uh, the little horn. Uh, in each of these cases, then, there is a, a division at that point uh, with the, the fourth world kingdom beginning uh, as Rome, the particular kingdom that dominated uh, Palestine, uh, the, the covenant community for a while. But then, with the dawning of the, the New Covenant, and more particularly with the demise of, of the Old in 70 AD, uh, we are launched into a new phase where there is no longer any one world kingdom that is dominating a, a particular localized uh, kingdom of God, because from this point on, there is no more 
localized theocratic community. From this point on, the covenant community is everywhere dispersed through the world. That's the, the nature of the new covenant is it's a universal uh, outreach and it's uh, throwing off the uh, limitations of the old order. We're now uh, in this uh, new covenant order of the universally distributed church. Where now is the kingdom of the world that is dominating the people of God? Well, n no one kingdom is doing that. It's, uh, uh, it's a matter of of all of the nations of the world, wherever, wherever and whenever, to whatever extent, uh, they are assuming a hostile attitude toward uh, the, the Lord and against his people. Uh, that's where the, the fourth kingdom uh, now uh, is. Well, that, that's some of the general background we've been working with. And, and in chapters 2 and 7, we're directly confronted then with questions of, of uh, this kind. Now, our discussion, putting this in, in the broader framework of our, our whole course and what we're up to at this point. As you recall, we are, are looking at this out of a particular interest in, the, in uh, coming to an understanding of the, the eschatological pattern of things uh, that is uh, presented to us in, in uh, the uh, scriptures, and in particular the way in, in which uh, the question of the millennium figures in, in uh, our, our, our thinking about the shape of things to come uh, as eschatology. And uh, so I, I'm developing, a, as we indicated, a, a thesis trying to show that uh, alone of the major views of the millennium, uh, the amillennial view does uh, justice to the representations of biblical prophecy, whereby the old, whereby the, the kingdom of God does not come in, in uh, external dominance and power until the uh, old world represented by these uh, four kingdoms has come to an end. In other words, the, it, it awaits the consummation. So the Old Testament prophecies of the coming of God's kingdom, and there are, of course, such prophecies in the Old Testament, and not just that Messiah would come and that he would suffer and so forth, uh, that is there too, but the Old Testament prophecies definitely point ahead to a, a time when uh, when the kingdom of God would be uh, universal and, and it would be uh, uh, one of universal power and, and glory in the, and uh, indeed of eternal glory. And uh, the biblical evidence is to the effect that that does not happen until the consummation itself. And uh, any other view than the amillennial view, whether pre-mill or, or post-mill, you know, results in, in the thought that the kingdom comes in power and glory before the consummation. So I prefer to, in, 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 in place of the regular uh, terminology of pre-millennial, post-millennial, amillennial, I, I think it's more, <coughs> more instructive to, to label these uh, several views in, in terms of where they posit the fulfillment of these Old Testament uh, prophecies of the kingdom of power and glory. And I, these are both pre and post mill, uh, they put it uh, before the consummation. Uh, the pre mills put it after the parousia uh, because they put the millennium after the parousia. That's why we usually call them pre mills. Pre mills put the coming of the kingdom as a kingdom of power and glory after the parousia, but their millennium uh, then, of course, leads up to the consummation too, and so the kingdom for them has come before. At the consummation, uh, post mills uh, put the millennium properly so before the parousia, uh, which is for them the consummation. But the, the, what is distinctive of the post mill view too is that, that it posits the coming of uh, the uh, glory kingdom uh, in the millennium, which is before the consummation. So both pre and post millennial views uh, are pre consummation views pre-consummation views in the sense I'm suggesting that they see the kingdom coming in glory before the con only the Amil view uh, is a, a post-consummation view so of course the Amil view agrees with the with uh, the post-mill view that the millennium is now that is before the, the, the parousia dash consummation but that's precisely the difference then I would say between Amils and post-mills is uh, our understanding of what the millennium is. We, we both posit the millennium now, but the, <coughs> the, the Amils with uh, no expectations of, uh, of, of dominance for, for the people of God 
uh, before the, the Lord's uh, return. Uh, rather, we are impressed with the, the massive biblical evidence to the effect that the nature of the church at this time is, is the church in the wilderness as it's presented in Revelation 12, 13. Uh, that is the church which is sharing the sufferings of Christ at this present time. And uh, whereas in, in defiance of all, all of this evidence, uh, uh, post-millennialists are, are, are looking for the, 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 the powerful glory presence of, of God's kingdom during this present uh, church age. And uh, there's, a, you know, there's a lot of practical differences. They're not then in, in the way you, you see that, what your expectations are as a Christian and, and uh, what the, the church's expectations uh, 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 might, might be for its future here before the, the Lord returns. And you, you end up with rather a different outlook as to uh, what is in store for, for the, the Christian community. And to, the, to some extent, I would think that bears upon how you would even and see the functions of the church, at least what you might emphasize in connection with the church's uh, ministry. So this is the, the larger question we are concerned with, and we are trying to get at it now through exegesis of, of the book of Daniel and then of Ezekiel, and, and perhaps tying it in then uh, as, as time is allowing with, uh, with the, the way in which the book of Revelation picks all of this up and sets it forth in a powerful way again uh, uh, for us. And uh, so uh, the, along with the various specific points of exegesis that are concerning uh, us and the distinctive uh, details of chapters 2 and 7, uh, sort of the, 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 the central point of it to, is to try to show that there's a, a pattern whereby <coughs> when you come to the fourth, fourth kingdom and, and beyond, especially then when you come to its second stage, uh, which uh, will be uh, described in terms of that concept of the three and a half years, we'll see uh, the, that idea already comes up as, as defining stage B in the, of the fourth kingdom, the time, the times, and the half the time, the three and a half years, four <coughs> months, 12, 60 days. Uh, the, the, that period then is the period of the church age. As we uh, saw already when we uh, dealt with the 70 weeks passage in Daniel uh, 9, that was the 70th week, the messianic uh, age, the age of the, the new covenant, uh, gets to be divided in two at 70 AD, so that the whole period of the church's existence from its di di disengagement with uh, Jerusalem and the old order in 70 AD, from that point on to the end, uh, that is uh, put forth as a uh, uh, the three and a half years, and that same three and a half years now we encounter in connection with chapters two and and, and, and seven. So it's, it's it's that period of the church age, and uh, our concern then is to show that uh, throughout this period, the representations are that uh, the the beast power, the world power, is uh, not done away. Yet, in, uh, in fact, it is with its blasphemies and its persecutions, uh, uh, exerting a lot of influence and power in, in the world. In fact, you get the language, uh, before we're done here, we're looking at chapter 7, you get the language of how the little horn is prevailing against the, the people of, of God, right up to the time, right up to the time that the great white throne judgment scene appears, in the Ancient of Days, and the Son of Man, and, and, and that whole complex of, of final judgment. And uh, that's our point, then. That the, the world is very much on, on the scene in power as a persecuting power, and uh, we, which means, of course, that the church is not realizing some golden age, whether post millennial or pre millennial uh, sort of thing, right up until that great white throne judgment event, that, that final parousia with, with the coming of the ancient of days, with the coming of the, the Son of Man, at which point. Two things happen simultaneously, and they're bound up with each other, and this is our thesis, that uh, uh, the world comes to an end forever. The image is destroyed, it's polarized, the wind blows it away, it's not a trace of it is left. Chapter 7, the beast, the little <laughs> horror, and everything connected with him is burned up and disappears. That's the end of the world power. There is no world power after that. It, there's nothing around to come popping up uh, on the historical scene after that, but simultaneously uh, with that event, 
the kingdom and the sovereignty and the power and the glory is now handed over to the Son of Man who represents Messiah together with the saints of the Most High. And at this point, it is that the saints possess the kingdom and the sovereignty. It's at this point that the kingdom comes in, 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 in power and, in, and glory. And those two things are together, and the glory for God's kingdom doesn't come until the, the total termination uh, of uh, uh, the world power. Now, the implications you can see of that pattern, if you try to work that into either a pre-mill or a post-mill scheme, you see that they can't do it. Uh, for one thing, just to illustrate, we'll be coming back to this when, after we've worked our way through the text. But to just take, for example, the pre-mill view. Uh, they see the end of the church age, not as the great white throne judgment scene, of course, uh, but as the parousia. And of course, it is the parousia. Their mistake is to see, think that the parousia is something different than the great white throne judgment of them. Uh, but they, they see this as the parousia, then they see that there is a, a, a millennium coming that they suppose after that. And uh, then how does the millennium end? Well, it ends with Gog and Magog, uh, the, the, the most horrendous global uh, attack and assault and besieging of, of the people of God that there has ever been. And the uh, question then is, well, then they would have their great white throne judgment scene, and then they would have, uh, uh, well, the confirmation and, and, and the, the, the kingdom coming in, in, in power and, and, and glory after that. But meanwhile, of course, in the millennium, they, they have already anticipated the, the coming of the kingdom in power and glory. So what, what happens then after the great white front, uh, judgment throne is sort of anticlimactic. It's already happened uh, before that at this point. Well, just the one, one difficulty that emerges from this, if, uh, the, if the evidence in the Bible is to the effect that, that uh, in connection with the parousia event, uh, with the coming of uh, the uh, uh, Son of Man, uh, that, that the world power comes to, to an end and doesn't exist anymore, then uh, how could there be a, an assault a thousand years later uh, on, on a global scale even uh, against the people of God? So the pre-mill reconstruction uh, simply does not fit in with the really, after all, very simple biblical pattern of eschatology here. We see these two things happening together and the glory of God's kingdom not come until the total eclipse and, and uh, elimination uh, of, of the world power. Well, those are the, that's the broad outlines of what we're trying to establish. Let's go back then and uh, work our way through Daniel 2 a little and Daniel 7 and pick up some of the distinctive uh, features of them. And we already then were... Dealing with the second chapter, I guess we were in that too long to uh, deal with it, but there's the the uh, image, and it's very in in impressive, more so than the sketch I put on the board, even. <laughs> and uh, it's, it's it's a massive, <laughs> in, in, impressive uh, work of, of human manufacture and so on, with all of the precious metals and, and so forth. And um, we were suggesting then that there was a particular ideological uh, relationship between uh, the kingdom of the world that is, as it is perceived here through, uh, through the eyes of Nebuchadnezzar and, and his vision uh, and uh, the, the episode back there the, the roots of Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar after all is in, in the tradition of the Tower of Babel in the, in the plains of Shinar. That's where his kingdom is. And, and, and the, the old ideals of, of the original Genesis 11 Tower of Babel are the ones that now inform the Nebuchadnezzar's Babylonian uh, enterprise. And the ideal we suggested back in Genesis 11, you know, it, it's, a, it's a, an attempt to restore the, the original unity and coherence and, uh, that was provided in the Garden of Eden by the, the presence of God on the mountain of God as the central uh, focus of things as has been lost in, 
in uh, the, the fall and there's been a, a dispersion. Cain uh, already is, is complaining uh, he, he, from Genesis 3 on uh, the, of this kind of problem that he's going to be scattered in the world. Well, Genesis 11, that was still their problem. Uh, again, after the, the flood, and what they're after is, is togetherness again, an ecumenical kind of, of, of cohesiveness in, in uh, the kingdom, lest they be scattered on the, the world, but it all coming uh, to expression in, in a, a towering manifestation of, of, uh, of salvation by works, of uh, thus uh, build our, our access ladder to heaven and immortality by the strength of our arms, by uh, our building operations, and so we will be kept together as the people who can even attain to that. So at different levels, there, there's, there, there's a rejection of, of uh, the whole message of salvation by grace and the coming of the kingdom by, by grace and the provision of, of immortality uh, so that we don't have to say who will go up for us into heaven, who will go down to us uh, here. Uh, at, uh, Deuteronomy 30, 11 through 14, it's provided by grace. The Tower of Babel Builders rejected all of that. And this is what is also rejected now in Nebuchadnezzar's ideology of, of uh, the world kingdom. And so unity is the ideal. And uh, unity is best found with, with Nebuchadnezzar himself, the head of gold, as he is identified. And uh, but then there's deterioration uh, represented by the, the statue in two respects, in, in terms of, of, of position, of course, from the top down, it would indicate from superiority to inferiority, just in terms of position. But what is uh, provided uh, uh, by way of a scale of, of, of values from the top down uh, by position is reinforced then by the nature of the metals, which are of, of decreasing value, of course, as you move from the gold to the silver to the brass to the iron to the iron and, and the clay. So inferiority marks the, the, the history and uh, it, it is certainly that in terms of, of the ideal of unity and coherence that this is true, not, not certainly in, in terms of, of an ideal of, of uh, extent or, or, or power and, and so on. Uh, that of course is, uh, that ideal is best achieved at the end, which is then something that chapter 7 brings out if you compare chapter 2. and. In chapter seven, with the images, when well, the climax is reached in chapter seven, of course, with the with the fourth kingdom, with the nameless beast, with the iron teeth and uh, the claws of bronze and so on. Uh, but uh, unity was uh, more obvious there at, at in the top, and so the the text does emphasize the the decreasing character of the thing in terms of of that idea, so that it even tells us, look, we. It's not just that the metals are uh, in, inferior as you move down the iron, but they're even mixed when you come to the feet of iron and clay. And iron and clay it tells us then they do not mix together. And, and, and so the kingdom will be made up of uh, different groups that will not cling together. Well, that's, that, that's the overall uh, perspective then of the ideal that we, we, we see here in, in chapter 2. And, uh, well, uh, also part of uh, th what's going on in, in, in this way of looking at it is not just a, a, a resumption of uh, Genesis 11, but, but a resumption of the whole divine kingship ideology that emerges earlier on even in Genesis 6 and then repeatedly throughout uh, the uh, uh, scripture. And uh, so here in, in Daniel 2, uh, that idea of, of human kingship, which is what this statue is all about, that's what this statue represents as human kingship, institutionalized the various kingdoms, uh, and um, what uh, these kingdoms are, are, are doing is uh, presenting a context then within which the, the human kings can can uh, go to an excess to, uh, with, that they have a proper authority, but of course then they abuse it. And you get the, the, the Antichrist syndrome taking effect, which is I will exalt my throne above the thrones of heaven and so on. I will become super God. Uh, that's what goes on 
in, in uh, Genesis 6 and so on, and that's what's going on in, in uh, Daniel 2. Uh, you compare with Daniel 2, the next chapter, which is Daniel 3, and the next one, the, 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 this whole set of, of, of passages here all help us to interpret the, the, the vision in, in terms of, of an expression of of uh, the, the, this divine kingship uh, ideology. Chapter 3, of course, is the, the image which is set up in the plain with the, the demands of Nebuchadnezzar that, uh, as to who and when and what to, and how uh, the, this image should be uh, worshipped and uh, who should pray to their gods when and where and, 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 and uh, who are refused. So the, the, it comes with... Uh, uh, the, the chapter 2 image with the, the accompanying image of chapter 3 which uh, reinforces this and then of course in chapter 4 uh, the hubris of, of, of Nebuchadnezzar is expressed in his parading around on the, the, the walls of his city and, and uh, saying that he is the one who by his power has done this for his own glory and so on and of course then there must be the humbling of the king that takes place but, but the whole package of things uh, gives one clear impression of, uh, of uh, what chapter 2 is saying uh, about the nature of the, of the world kingdom. Legitimate thing though it is, how greatly it has become uh, perverted. And uh, this perversion, of course, uh, then finds its extreme expression in uh, its blasphemous uh, uh, claims over against the, the Lord of Heaven. Now when we come to chapter 7, I think we'll see that along with the uh, the thought of the blasphemies, that there is a, 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 an emphasis on the, the persecution of the saints as well. The hatred of God's people uh, comes out especially in, in chapter 7 where uh, you, you have power enough in, in, in each case and you have uh, self-exaltation in each case. But in, in chapter 7 it becomes more explicit that the power of the world, especially the little horn uh, uh, phase of things, is uh, one that expresses itself in, in persecuting uh, the, the people uh, of uh, the Lord. Well, there then is uh, uh, the, the image and uh, God's answer to the to the fourth kingdom, well, to the to the to the the, the whole image. But the, the, the answer here that uh, comes with uh, <laughs> with the fourth kingdom is a, a, a blow that is directed, we are told, against the feet. Not, not against the, the legs of iron, but against uh, the, the feet of iron and clay. Not against, uh, I suppose it would be the, the ankles, that there would be the division in, in the, the anatomy of the thing between stage A and B. And uh, the stone doesn't strike... Uh, the legs, it doesn't strike at the, the ankles, but it strikes, if, if it had struck up there, the feet would never have developed because the, the result of the stone striking the image is that it is broken in pieces, too sweet, then pulverized, or the, it would never have been able to develop into the stage represented by the, the feet and the toes of iron and clay, but it does develop into that, and uh, therefore the, the blow is one that comes not along the, the way here, uh, but uh, at the, the end of history, this is the final judgment of the world. Well, that's the striking of the image. But meanwhile, uh, we've had an earlier statement that the stone was cut out of the mountain. So uh, we have two, two phases of the thing, which I think have to be separated. Uh, we, we read about a mountain, and of course there should be no question about what the mountain is uh, uh, if we, in fact let's maybe look at it if we have uh, here we're looking at Daniel too but uh, let's let, let's look at I Isaiah too and uh, these two chapters have pretty much the same outlook before we're done with Daniel too of course this little bit of a mountain which was coexisting with the, the world power with the, the image after it has destroyed the world image will become the great mountain that fills the whole earth. There's our thesis. After it destroys the image, after there is no more image, that's when the little kingdom becomes a great kingdom and, and not uh, before. But that is then what does happen. The, the development of the typological kingdom 
into the global cosmic kingdom. Well, <clears throat> Isaiah 2 presents that same thing. Let's just uh, want to keep looking at our Hebrew Bibles. We might never do it again. <laughs> and uh, so uh, Isaiah, well, let's look at Isaiah. By the way, your term papers uh, were a pleasure to read. I'll have them in your boxes before the day is over. It uh, did keep me from getting into mischief during the uh, in my <laughs> vacation week, week uh, but uh, it was a, it was actually a pleasure to uh, read a lot of good work on them. And I think those three passages, no matter which one you pick, that I think they're all fascinating passages with uh, interesting problems in them. And it's interesting also to see how dogmatically you, you people can uh, establish opposite points of view. <laughs> <laughs> We've learned from the best. <laughs> uh, you, you, you don't have any dogmatic professors, do you? <laughs> All right. Uh, Isaiah 2. Isaiah 2. After the introductory first word about the Isaiah's uh, word coming to him, then the, the second, uh, the second verse, uh, and then here's another. We've had several of these Baharit Hayamim passages along the way. Have we remember Genesis 49 and, uh, and then the Hosea passage and so on? There are only about a half a dozen. Here's another one of them uh, in Isaiah 2. And so, you know, of course, we, are, we signalize that the, this is the, the, the ultimate uh, disposition of things. This is the way history turns out. This is the, the goal of uh, eschatology. It will be ba'acharit hayamim nakon, nifal, participle there from kun. Established shall be, now here you have it, the mountain. We're, we're concerned with the, the mountain. And uh, clearly, of course, it's... Uh, referring to Zion, where the temple, the house of God was, says, uh, that's the mountain. And so it is called the mountain of the house of God. What the Old Testament Zion represented, uh, and, and since Zion is Armageddon, uh, what the Old Testament uh, Armageddon uh, represented uh, symbolically will at last be realized. Established will be the mountain of the house of the Lord now it says Birosh uh, Heharim. You could say at. They use the debate in the sense of at the top of the, the mountains, uh, but probably better in the sense of the, the Beta Senti as hmm, that the mountain of the Lord will be established as the highest of the mountains of all the earth. It's not quite the same imagery as Daniel 2. Uh, where this one mountain replaces any, any others uh, along the way, but it's uh, another way of saying the same thing, of course, the ultimate exaltation of uh, God's place, his, his mountain. So it will be established as Rosh, as the highest of all the mountains, and then expressing the same thought synonymously. It, it says uh, Nissa, Nifal, from uh, Nasa to lift up, and uh, here the, the the men would be comparative. Huh? They will be lifted up and they give a oat above uh, all of uh, the other hills uh, of the world. And the result will be then that there shall flow unto it all the, the goyim. So here is the universalism uh, that is uh, part of the messianic uh, kingdom. And verse 3, and many peoples, amim rabim, Alaku will go up, and they will say, "Come, we're not Allah. Let us go up unto the Har Yahweh, unto the uh, mountain of the Lord." And again, the parallel is is the Beit, the house. This time called the Beit Elohei Yaakov, the 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 house of the God of Jacob. And then we Yorenu. Now there's your verb Yara, from which you get the noun Torah. Hmm? instruction and so on, the verb yara, to instruct, to feel. And uh, he will, and with the suffix enu, a first common plural. So, uh, and he will instruct us, the house of the Lord, and he will instruct us about his ways, and the result will be, that we will walk in his paths, 
for mitzion. Now, there is the word Torah. You see, we had the verb, the yara, uh, that uh, he will instruct, and now the, the noun Torah. And, and so from, from Zion, there shall go forth uh, the, the, the covenantal instruction. Uh, the Torah, yea, the word of Yahweh from Jerusalem. And uh, then there is, of course, the, the, the bringing in, in of eternal peace in connection with that, the end of uh, warfare and strife among the nations. Uh, which uh, results from the fact that he will judge among the nations and he will uh, hokia, we might translate adjudicate, huh? he will adjudicate uh, among the, the many peoples and the result is uh, then the familiar cutting off of the, their, their swords uh, to be plowshares and, their, and uh, they will be, uh, their, their spears, they will be uh, turning into pruning hooks. And lo, yesa goy el goy cherev, not will nation lift up uh, uh, against another nation the cherev, the sword. Where lo, yil madu, not will they learn anymore, you'll come up war. And, uh, and so there is your picture of, uh, of uh, the kingdom of, of glory. And in Isaiah 2, the, the emphasis is on uh, the idea of uh, the peace, huh? wouldn't you say? Uh, that, that's the major emphasis. This is Shiloh's, uh, the Prince of Peace's kingdom. And uh, so uh, when, when he establishes this mountain, the highest of all the mountains up there, then the kingdom of, of peace will be established. We won't take the time to look at it. Uh, uh, now some of you had occasion to refer to it, I remember in your term papers, but in, I, in, in Isaiah 6, there, there is a, another short passage uh, in, in which uh, sort of the, 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 the sequence of the lawsuit, which keeps popping up here in these early chapters of Isaiah, the, the sequence of the lawsuit is interrupted by, by brief descriptions of uh, the coming uh, uh, kingdom of uh, the New Covenant, chapter 2, <coughs> emphasizing peace, and the one in chapter 6, uh, the, the emphasis is uh, now more on the glory of the kingdom as it depicts the assembly. It de depicts the whole assembly of God's uh, uh, people uh, on Mount Zion with the crowning glory o over the whole thing. And so the two <coughs> chapters give balanced uh, portraits of, of uh, the nature of the kingdom. But in, in each case, well, what is uh, clear, which we had no doubt about anyway, I suppose, is that in Daniel 2, uh, the mountain uh, certainly represents the Old Testament, the typological, the theocratic uh, uh, kingdom. So without hands, that is to say, therefore, supernaturally, huh? a rock is cut out from the mountain, first coming of Christ, huh? first coming of Christ, the, the, the Episode one, the, the incarnation, the, the Messiah enter, enters into uh, uh, the, the world, and uh, everything then gets very much uh, uh, condensed. Uh, uh, the distinction between uh, uh, the first and the second comings is, is compressed, and uh, the next thing we hear about is uh, then uh, the, the act of judgment. Now, of course, in, in, in between there, as we deal with the analogy of scripture and we see what the, uh, the concept of the kingdom of God is expounded elsewhere in, in, in the scriptures, we, we know that to, to give a, a, a balanced picture of it, we do have to speak about a coming of the kingdom here in terms of what Christ has done at his first coming, of course. Mm -hmm. And so there's the whole semi-eschatological, realized, unrealized, uh, already not yet, way of, uh, of, of describing what is already true as a result of Christ's first coming, even before he, he comes uh, again. And uh, now that isn't what the, the focus is here. The focus is uh, not on that <coughs> sort of preliminary semi-eschatological coming of the kingdom, um, but it's on the, the ultimate uh, coming of the kingdom. And so when it says the stone strikes the, the image on, on the feet uh, here, uh, that, that's the power of Sia, that's the second coming, that's the, the great white throne uh, judgment that results in the total collapse of, of this thing. And uh, well, just before then getting back onto that, we, we have a, assumed, of course, the interpretation of the rock as the Messiah. And we should just note uh, something of the biblical evidence in, in support of that, especially in, in Matthew 21. Uh, we uh, looked at that parable at the end of Matthew 21 
when we were trying to establish the interpretation of, of uh, the statement in Daniel 9, uh, 26 and, and 27, uh, about Christ as the one who would uh, destroy uh, the, the city of Jerusalem and the temple in 70 AD. And we saw the, uh, a, a similar way of looking at things in the, the parable at the end of Matthew 21 and uh, the one at the beginning of Matthew 22. But in that same context, then, we have a, a, a combination, a cluster of, of quotations from the Old Testament using rock symbolism uh, uh, with reference to the uh, Messiah. So uh, in uh, Matthew 21, 42 through 44, there, there, there is one textual question in the Greek in the, the Matthew 21. Uh, if you want to compare another passage where you don't have a textual problem, uh, the parallel in Luke verse 20, uh, chapter 20, uh, verse 18, Luke 20, verse 18, uh, 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 helps us to settle the, the, the textual problem. Uh, as it reads in Matthew uh, 21, um, after the verdict is, is pronounced against uh, those uh, evil uh, uh, tenants, uh, he will bring those wretches to a wretched end, they replied, condemning themselves, and he will rent, uh, rent the vineyard to other tenants who will give him his share of the crop at harvest time. Jesus said to them, have you never read in the scriptures the stone the builders rejected has become the capstone. The Lord has done this, and it is marvelous in his eyes. And so there, there is the quotation uh, from Psalm 118 that, that, that Jesus presents. And presently, in connection with it, uh, we have uh, then uh, further citations uh, from uh, Isaiah 8 and uh, from our passage, uh, Daniel 2. And uh, Jesus goes on, Therefore I tell you that the kingdom of God will be taken away from you, given to a people who will produce its uh, fruit. And then verse 44. He who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces. And that's the Isaiah 8. And then, uh, but he on whom it falls uh, will be crushed. He on whom it falls when the stone strikes uh, the, the image, uh, the, the, there is the, the uh, uh, Daniel uh, 2 reference. So, so here for one thing is, uh, is uh, you know, what uh, has led us all to recognize we are dealing with, with a, a messianic symbol in, in the form of uh, this uh, uh, rock. Well, it strikes, it strikes the, uh, the image and um, the ideal of cohesiveness is shot. Huh? The exact opposite is the end result of this enterprise, which was aiming at that cohesive. Just as in the Tower of Babel, huh? there, unless we be scattered abroad in, in, in the world, and yet the, the the judgment that ensues is one that results in an aggravated dispersion. Whereas before they, they are dispersed uh, all, all over the place. That's what happened in in uh, Genesis 11. That's what happens in Daniel 2 complete pulverizing of uh, all of the parts of, of this image and then with the emphasis on the ruach, the wind of God which comes and uh, even the dust is, is scattered so that no trace of, of the thing is, uh, is, uh, is left anymore. Now I've tried then to argue in, in terms of, of the anatomy and everything where it's, it's, it strikes uh, uh, that it is uh, the second coming judgment, not, not, uh, the, not something connected with the Lord's first coming. This is one of the places where it is useful to keep in mind uh, Daniel 2 and Daniel 7 and then to uh, let each one help in the, in the uh, interpretation of the other. Uh, if you turn now to Daniel 7 and uh, here the, the, the timing, the timing of, of the, the striking of this judgment by the, the fifth kingdom on the, the fourth kingdom is uh, even clearer uh, and we'll see it again personally I trust but uh, you remember how it is that, that Daniel is, is looking because of the blasphemous words of this little horn. This little horn is uh, who is prevailing against the saints for the three and a half times, and, and uh, who, who did prevail against them until the until the, the heavenly divine councils, uh, the throne were, were, were set there. The council was in, in session, and, and uh, the one ancient of days took his uh, place there, and. and uh, 
and uh, from his throne that there emanates uh, the ordeal fire, the, the river of fire, the combination of the, of the, the, the two usual ordeal elements of water and fire in, 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 in one uh, river of fire that flows uh, forth. Uh, uh, it is all happening, Daniel says, because, he, because of the blasphemies of the little horn, the final antichrist stage uh, of the things has been reached with uh, uh, the, the little horn. And uh, in response to that, uh, there is the judgment of the, the ancient of days on the great white throne, which compares to the Revelation 21, of course. And uh, so clearly in, in Daniel 7, uh, the, the end of the world kingdom here, the, the judgment on the world kingdom is the, the final judgment because the, the beast with the ten horns and the, the, the little horn in particular, the beast is completely consumed in the flames. There is no beast uh, uh, left in the, the, uh, the world. So Daniel 7 helps us, uh, reinforces the, the arguments that are already present in the second chapter for understanding uh, the blow as, as being uh, uh, the blow of Christ when he appears in flaming fire his parousia, taking vengeance on those who know not God and those who believe not uh, the, the gospel. Now, if that is that is true, that the, the, the striking of the, the image is the second coming, then the sequel to that, which is the uh, stone now being transformed into the great mountain that fills the earth, leaving no room for the coexistence of a world kingdom. In, old, in, in the Old Testament period, God's kingdom and the world kingdom, kingdoms could coexist. The world's kingdoms continuing under the principle of common grace and so on, they could coexist. But when this takes place, and God's kingdom now is, is, is totally comprehensive of, of uh, the whole cosmos, there is no room for the world kingdoms. In fact, the common grace has come to an end. There is no more such coexistence. Uh, and uh, all right, so that's the picture that's uh, presented. And now that I think the, uh, I don't know uh, what has been the dominant opinion, but I suspect the dominant opinion that is uh, uh, current is that this transformation of the stone into the, the global uh, mountain uh, is conceived of as a, a picture of the, the spread of the gospel uh, through the fulfilling of the Great Commission in this present church age. Now that, I take it, is, is not really what's going on here. This is not that, that gradual uh, expansion of the church to the gathering in of those whom God is uh, saving, uh, but it is rather the, the, the abrupt, uh, sudden, cataclysmic, supernatural transformation that takes place at the final judgment. Uh, when <coughs> the, the world and all that is therein is eliminated and, and there emerges uh, the, the new heavens and the new earth, uh, uh, which of course is the creation motif. And that, by the way, is another thing that we want to keep in, in mind through all of this is the various ways in, in, in which this whole process is, uh, is set forth in terms of a, of a, a new creation. Uh, but what we're saying then is that the stone becoming in the mountain is, uh, is uh, that sudden, abrupt uh, descent of the, to put it in terms of the book of Revelation, of uh, the, the city Jerusalem, the holy city out of heaven to earth. That is a gradual process, but as an immediate uh, act of divine recreation uh, there that, that uh, takes place at the at that particular uh, point. So uh, not a gradual converting of, of, of the world as is being presented uh, here, but uh, rather the, the other as I, I, as I suggested. And there's, of course, our, 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 our thesis, too. When does this happen? It's uh, precisely then when the world comes to an end, it's pulverized, it isn't there anymore, now the kingdom comes in power and glory and total dominance, and the not before. So that, that's a very simple observation, and uh, and yet it has to be it has to be defied uh, in, in order to be if, if, if you want to be a free mill, you just have to reject the obvious here. The stone does not become the mountain until the image is completely destroyed. 
And once, once the kingdom of God is established, as represented by this uh, global cosmic mountain, uh, it is something we are told which is forever. Uh, the word universal, uh, or the concept universal, is presented in verse 35, and the concept of it's eternal is presented in verse uh, 44. And uh, notice well, that this mountain, this global mountain kingdom, it's not for some limited time. It is not a millennial kingdom with whatever duration, whether literal or figurative, that you want to give to the millennium, but it is not a, a, a limited, delimited uh, period of, of time, but it is a, a kingdom which is, is eternal. So there is no room for the concept of a, a millennium to be introduced premillennial style after the parousia judgment uh, on, uh, on the world. So uh, th that, I think, is uh, what we gather from Daniel 2, and then now we'll want to see how the same pattern emerges in, in uh, the Daniel uh, 7. And uh, uh, of course, we, uh, along with the, this un undercutting and making it possible a premillennial view, it, it also doesn't do any good for a postmillennial view, which uh, then has to face the fact that right up to that striking of the image, uh, the world kingdom does exist. Hmm? The world kingdom exists, uh, and uh, chapter 7, of course, brings it out uh, more plainly than the second, uh, but the world kingdom exists as, as something uh, which is mightily opposed and, and even to a very great degree successful in its opposition to the church. Yes, please. Um, the seed of iron flame is in everything after Rome, then? Yeah, so that, that's what it, sort of the beginning of the hour I was trying to suggest, that when you come to the B stage mm -hmm. of the fourth kingdom in either chapter, uh, that the A stage represents Rome, because uh, up until at least 70 AD, God's kingdom is, is right there in the land of Canaan. It can be defined. What kingdom oppressed it? Rome, obviously, was the one that, that controlled it. But from 70 AD on, kingdom of God is not localized anywhere, and so the, the, the enemy has to be, uh, to, by the same token, uh, universalized. Whenever, wherever the world kingdoms uh, defy their proper common grace uh, functions, uh, the, uh, suppress the true religion, uh, that's a manifestation of the enemies. That's a good time for but, uh, any other question on Daniel 2 before we go? Okay, let's take five and...